Hello and welcome to the free water workflow by LandKit where we will be exploring all the free features of WaterKit. We have our Grasshopper Canvas minimized down here in the corner and we'll be utilizing the workflow dashboard here. We also have a series of layers and layer structures set up and ready to go for you. So this will be piping directly into the Grasshopper script to be utilized for this workflow. The first tab that you see here is the info tab where we have some information and instructions as well as some tips and tricks on how to utilize this workflow and the layers as well. Jumping over here to the topo tab. For this workflow, we are actually generating our topography utilizing TopoKit and TopoKit's com um, components. If you want to learn a little bit more about the details of these different features and geometry and how to generate topography using TopoKit, please refer to the free Topo workflow or the pro Topo workflow tutorials. So we'll be skipping over a little bit of that description. For this workflow, we have some toggles for Topo detail and the higher that number is, the lower the resolution or the lower the detail is. And the lower that number is, the higher the resolution and the more detail we get. So I'm gonna keep that at a relatively high detail or high resolution since it does play into how our water is moving across the site. The extend mesh is a way of pushing the mesh and just uh, sort of offsetting it beyond its current boundary in case you wanna see the water flowing to a particular point or edge more detailed. Then we have our swales and our paths here, and that's where you're seeing these sort of uh, teal blue lines and these like very light tan lines coming right up the middle. These sort of switchbacks that you're seeing here, these are all generated using the path tool in TopoKit, which is in our Grasshopper script. And you'll see I have these different uh, pieces of geometry uh, turned off or unpreviewed for now, since uh, you can refer to how those work in the TopoKit uh, tutorials. So we can adjust these paths and swales, and the swales are being used um, here in these, and these are also paths. But then what we're doing is we're actually generating uh, basins using these uh, curves here as just contour curves or basin curves. And these are actually generating a uh, piece of topography that is offsetting in and down so that we can actually control a little bit of how our basins look and feel and how much water they stand to collect. So I can adjust my basin depth here. I can change that back down to one. And again, I have the steepness of the slides at 45%, so I could adjust that down to 25. And you'll see that we have a nice sort of modest representation of our basins um, as compared to before. So I'll show a little bit about how these basins are affecting the water uh, later on and what they're doing in terms of collecting water. But we'll jump that back up to a steeper uh, side and a deeper basin depth so that we're collecting more water. These uh, lines here, these basin lines, are being utilized as sort of break lines as well as the break lines here, which are being fed in through the break lines um, script. But if, for instance, you've already developed a topo mesh and you want to use that for this workflow, you can utilize and place your topo mesh into the meshes category here and then simply use that as your mesh for the water flow analysis and you can ignore all of these things. So if we jump over to the analysis tab here, this is where we're gonna really start to see uh, our water flowing and adjusting some of those parameters in the water flow themselves. So I'll turn off this environment boundary really quick and talk about that in a minute. But we can preview some of the different analysis layers such as elevation um, represented in points. So you'd have to look at that in plan view to really see where the elevation lies. We have our slope analysis, which allows us to see the slopes across our site and can be helpful for knowing how fast water might be moving across certain areas. And then we also have our catchments and upslope, but I'll show a little bit about how our flow lines look first and you can see how the water is moving across our site. So with the contours, we can really see that micrograding if we're starting to adjust um, our site and see what's happening as we're uh, adjusting things even before we have our flow lines turned on. But you can see that these break lines are really holding up the slope for these paths in order to prevent the water from spilling over and down. We're even using break lines to create these little swales on the side of our center path in order to collect the water so it's not flowing off down onto our path. And you can see it's collecting down into these swales. And at certain moments, the swale is actually uh, pushing the water off and into these basins. And we can, we can just adjust some of these uh, curves, this break line here, and you can see exactly how the water re responds to an immediate update on our site. 
So I drop that down a little bit and you can see it's now allowing the water to flow over that, that berm that I created before into these swales um, on the other side. So adjusting these different pieces of the geometry in this file and workflow will actually update things live and change things live as well. So perhaps we want a little bit more water catching in this basin. We could actually just adjust that by taking this corner, dropping it down, and you'll see that the water is now collecting a little bit more from these surrounding um, parts. So we'll get back, back, back to where it was, and I'll talk about what the flow uh, cell size is. So it's a little bit easier to see in plan view, but you can kind of tell that all of our flow lines are being generated in a grid on our site across the whole site. And those flow lines are the starting point, the, that grid is the starting points of these flow lines. So currently we have a spacing of 10 feet by 10 foot grid. So we can actually adjust that up and down in order to increase or decrease the amount of flow lines that are generating across our site. This is particularly important when you're dealing with larger sites or smaller sites. You really want to adjust this to increase or decrease processing speed and increase or decrease the resolution as well. So this is a great way to control not just the processing speed, but also the visual output with more or less flow lines on our site. And you can see that the water sort of collecting in that basin at this top edge, which indicates I might need to make some adjustments to that. The other uh, control here is the environment cell size. So I'll increase that back up to 10. The environment cell size is really what affects the grid of points being generated in our environment. And the environment is where we are going to see our other two analysis layers here. So that environmental cell size really works for these other uh, drop downs here. So for instance, the upslope area. The upslope area is a way of calculating for each, any given point on our site or location within this uh, environment that we have, and again, this environment encompasses our entire mesh, um, topo mesh here, it's actually calculating how, how many points are actually flowing into that specific point location. So we, if we have a lot of areas upslope from a particular point, it's going to be a lot darker, and if we have a lot fewer areas that are flowing across those points, it'll be a lot lighter. So you can see in some of these areas, we have a lot of flow lines uh, coming across and in some areas we don't. And this is just a great way of sort of getting a gauge of where the water is actually collecting or flowing the most, potentially for erosion control purposes. And then the other one is for the catchments. And the catchments are really about understanding the sub um, watersheds across our site. So a lot of these blues are a little bit more subtle, but if you look closely, you can see that uh, the different colors of blue represent the different watersheds across our site or the catchments across our site. And this is a great way of knowing like which areas of our site are connected to each other in terms of water flow so that we can really place and guide our water and basins into particular locations for catching and storing that water. And this is where the environmental cell size comes into play. So understanding your catchments and where your water is flowing and how it's flowing and where those catchments are happening can be adjusted by this cell size here. So if I increase that to 10, we're gonna get a 10 by 10 grid of points across our site. And this is uh, processing a lot fewer points with this larger cell size. So on a larger site, again, you might want to increase this value, but on a smaller site, you might wanna know a little bit more detail about where those catchments are on your site so that you can really understand where water is connecting and flowing to. And this is a great segue into talking about basins. So, or excuse me, basins and pipes. So we have our basins that are catching water and you can see, for instance, in this particular location, we have this basin collecting a very small amount of water. So there's maybe an opportunity for this basin to collect more water if it's connected to another catchment. And that's where pipes come into play. So on the pipes layer here, we can take a line and inside of that basin, we can connect it to another basin. And what it's gonna do is that, that pipe is going to represent whether that is your understanding of how the water is actually flowing on the site connecting these two basins in, in terms of a catchment or watershed area, or it could be an actual pipe itself representing an overflow pipe for the different basins coming down this, um, this sort of step down topography. And this allows us to sort of connect these different basins together to create a more comprehensive um, catchment. So I can connect all of these together if I want and create a much larger and broader single catchment across this entire site. 
side of the site if I'd like to. So you can see that all of this space and this space and this space and this space and all fall within the same catchment now because they're all connected by pipes. And lastly, we have our outputs here and our outputs are showing our baked topography. So if we wanna bake out that topography that we have in here in case we're using break lines and other uh, geometry to adjust it. And again, if you already have a topo mesh, maybe this is not as useful for you. But we also have our bake flow lines where we can actually bake out the flow lines and utilize those for other purposes. And it creates a layer here for us. And lastly, we have our saving here. So we have our save current settings and low current savings. And this is really useful for if you just need to close out your file really quick and open it back up, you can do so utilizing these. Um, but if you're trying to save a couple of different options, as, as in you're changing a lot of these parameters in, in here, and you really want to be able to flip between two different types of cell sizes or um, swale and uh, topography types, this is a great way of saving those options and being able to create a drop down menu for selecting those. Thank you so much. And if you'd like more information about these workflows or other parts of LandKit, please visit our website at landkit.design. Um, also visit our campus page where you can download more workflows or learn a little bit more about the components and details and um, tutorials and templates of LandKit. And lastly, every Friday from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, a member of the Landau team will be available for free at our office hours where you can uh, get some tips and tricks or some guidance and troubleshooting for any of your LandKit needs.